I'm going to advertise to my uh, our video game console hacking panel. Uh, hopefully, you're all excited uh, to be here. I know I'm excited for this one. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and kick this off by passing it over to Professor Nima Moshiri. Cool. Thanks. Uh, should we should we start recording, by the way? And did you want to pull up the slides? Uh, it is. Recording. Oh, it is recording. Oh, sorry. Sorry, because the button yeah. doesn't. My bad. Uh, cool. So, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Nima Moshiri. I'm an assistant teaching professor in the CSE department. Uh, you might recognize me from CSE 100 if you've either taken it with me or if you saw the textbook that I wrote. Um, I research viral evolution, and right now I've been working a lot on COVID-19 research. Um, but as far as kind of in my free time, I really like, uh, you know, video games are kind of my big passion. Uh, so... You know, I, in, in the past, I followed the homebrew scenes for PSP, Nintendo Wii, Nintendo Switch. Um, I was briefly involved with the, here, I'm going to, yeah, uh, I'm going to maybe share my screen. Or, Dimitri, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, let me, let me do one here real quick. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, but yeah, so I, I followed the scenes for a couple different uh, gaming consoles back in the day, but I never got too involved with them. Uh, more recently, I jumped on the Final Fantasy VII modding scene. Uh, which has been a lot of fun. So if you want to check out an open source project I made, check out PyFF7. Um, but yeah, so so I was invited to talk about video game hacking, but unfortunately, I'm not the biggest expert on this. Uh, so I thought I'd reach out to the kind of the key person that I've been following to get my video game hacking info. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome Dimitris. He's joining us. Uh, you can you can hop to the next slide if you want. Okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Well, hey, um, uh, Nima, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to to this. Um, I was uh, very, very surprised and very honored to to uh, to get the invite from you a couple of months ago. Now it's been it's been a little while since you reached out. Um, so thank you. Uh, so for those people that don't know who I am, uh, I'll just do a little bit, quick little bit of housekeeping. Uh, my name's Demetrius, and um, you may know me on YouTube as Modern Vintage Gamer. Um, I uh, my YouTube channel is about so it's about all sorts of things but i guess the general focus is about the modding and homebrew scenes on various consoles that have been um around over the years as well as a focus on the security side of the house as well um so i've also i kind of grew up in the original xbox scene as a homebrew developer and in PSP, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and more recently Nintendo Switch. I kind of dabbled in that scene for a little while. That was kind of fun. So I've always had, you know, one one eye or one ear on, on those various communities over the years. And I never really got out of those communities, I guess. Um, but just these days, I, I'm also professionally, I work in, in game dev. I work at um, Night Dive Studios as, as a developer there. And Folks may know Night Dive from games such as System Shock, Doom 64, Turok, um, games like that. So I kind of took my my homebrew development skills and and kind of landed a job in the industry. And I've been I've been there probably I think almost a year now, which is going really well. Um, and of course, you know, you guys know me um, on YouTube. So, um, but enough about me. Um, what we're going to talk about today? And Nima, are you are you good for me to kind of get get stuck into this or yeah absolutely go for it so uh no i mean yeah thanks everyone for joining us uh if you have any questions i'll be monitoring the chat in the q a section so uh dimitris i might interject every now and then sure. just to kind of yeah ask you a and, question. and please feel free just to interject anyway if there's any questions or if there's any anything you want to add um i will say so we're going to talk about the uh i guess the history of video game hacking and that is a lot to cover so <laughs> we so we've kind of um you know, just kind of compressed it down into some of the major details over history. So there's there's probably some stuff on here that that you're familiar with, but there's probably some stuff that we don't talk about. It's not because we, we, we're we not familiar with it or we, we forgot about it. It's just some things have to give. So we, we kind of went from the early 8-bit days up to, I'll say, the Xbox 360 and, and PlayStation 3. So anything kind of beyond that, like the PS4 and the Switch and 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 whatnot, we don't really we're not we don't cover in this, but um, we can certainly take questions at the end if you have any questions about um, various you know um, hacks that were done to systems. I guess the other thing I will say is we don't really talk about handhelds too much, so things like the DS, the 3DS um, aren't really covered in this. 
but we do cover you know the the PSP um, as well. So um, like I said, we're we're trying to uh, get as much as we can, much info as we can over the next you know hour and a half or so. And there's a lot of slides, so I'll I'll jump into it. So I guess to start, you know, how where did hacking kind of originate? And I guess it's not really um, something that can be answered easily because if you've ever used a computer or if anyone's ever used a computer, hacking has always been a part of, of, you know, using a computer, trying to make it do things that not necessarily was intended for. And I guess my earliest memories of, of hacking was back in the old home computer days. So my first ever computer that I owned was a Commodore VIC 20. And this was going back in the, in the early eighties. And back in those days, um, I didn't have a, a disc drive that came with the, the system it actually came with a, a cassette player so you would you know in in australia and in england and parts of europe it was pretty common that you would buy games on cassette and then just load them off cassette onto onto the machine so the the vic 20 came with a a cassette drive and you would you would buy games that look like this right so they just look like regular cassettes but they had you know game data on them and you would load them and and the the loading process was very very slow it took a long, long time to to load, usually like 10 minutes or something. So you would kind of go off and come back and, and the game would maybe be ready for you, assuming that the cassette didn't have, throw an error or something. But uh, games came on cassette and look, they were very easy to duplicate. With something like this, uh, you could just simply just duplicate the tape. So you would just buy a blank cassette from, from the local store and you would put your original in and you would just dub the cassette like you would do back in the day. So pretty easy, but what was interesting about this was it didn't take long before software houses became smarter with, with tape duplication. And when you tried to do the duplication method, sometimes you would get errors and it wasn't really apparent as to why you would get those errors because I mean, you're just kind of copying one cassette to the other, you're copying the data. But what actually was happening was they became the software duplicators and the software houses got smarter with how they would master cassettes. And essentially what they would do is they would put weak signals to prevent the duplication. So they would kind of, they would, they would set the level of the, the, the digital data to as low as possible, but just enough for the, the cassette to actually load the original. So when you tried to make a copy, if, if you've ever tried to copy a cassette or a VCR, and I'm, I'm going back a long, long time, a video cassette, the, the copy was always a little, you know, it wasn't as good as the original as far as the way it looked. It was always artifacting. And that's also true of, of audio. So they kind of mastered it with a weak signal to pre prevent duplication. But you could get around this if you had a good tape deck and if you had an EQ, you know, to kind of adjust the mid-range and, and boost levels and stuff like that, you could, um, you, could, you, you could make a duplicate of the tape. But this was, I guess this was the earliest form of, of copy protection that, that I can remember going back, you know, a long, long time ago. And it's not necessarily the, the earliest in history, but it's definitely one of the earliest ones that I can definitely recall. Now, after some time, you know, we moved on to disk drives and disk drives were more advanced. Um, most of these disk drives that you see here, like the Commodore 1541, the Atari 1050, they actually had microprocessors inside of the disk drive itself, right? So they were pretty smart as, as far as what they could do. And what the, uh, some of the initial, I guess, methods that the uh, software houses tried to thwart piracy was with a couple of different methods. And these are, this is just an example of some that they use. This is definitely not a comprehensive list. Um, in some cases, they would intentionally put a disk error on the original disk. So when you made a copy of it, if there was no error on the copy, then you know it's a copy, so it would fail, right? Um, sometimes they would put extra tracks. So a, 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 a physical disk media has a certain number of tracks and number of sectors. They would put extra tracks on the, on the disk, and that would also, you know, uh, have an impact on when you tried to make a copy of, of that disc. Um, Non-standard non signature, signature tracks, they would maybe have some weird track on the disc that had some type of key or some type of serial number that wasn't easily duplicated. Uh, weak and fuzzy bits, that's something where the bit itself, when you read the data off the disc, it's an indeterminate state. It may come back as a one or it may come back as a zero. 
um, Spira disk, which was one that was used on Bounty Bob Strikes Back. That was essentially when data was written in between the tracks itself. So you would read the tracks, but there was also data kind of in the middle of them. So you would kind of move the drive head slightly and get access to that data. So different ways were, were kind of come up with to, to beat the pirates. But essentially, none of this really helped because the smart smart hackers out there, the smart crackers were able to pretty much circumvent any type of disk copy protection uh, that was kind of uh, you know a thing at the time. Now, there was some really terrible copy protection. And for those people that have seen my, my videos, um, you're probably familiar with this one. This is the lens lock. And this one I did a video on recently. Um, and uh, just on the slide decks here, you can see there's a link to the YouTube video um, as well. So I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be um, setting out the slides after or at some point. So uh, I know there was already a question about that. So we'll We'll definitely follow up on that, but uh, the lens lock was um, was a pretty you know pretty simple form of copy protection, but it was also very very tedious to use. So essentially, what you would do is this was this device had a row of prisms, a piece of plastic, and what you would do is you would calibrate it against the CRT or the screen until the words OK were displayed through the lens itself. And then once you had calibrated it, you would press. Uh, the enter key and then a two digit code would appear through the lens lock and then you would key that in in order to get access to the game. Uh, I made a video on this recently and it's very, very tedious to use. Um, you get three attempts at it and if you if you miss out, you have to basically reload the game all over again. And as mentioned, if you're loading the game from cassette, that's a 10 minute, 10 minute wait. So it kind of punished the, the I guess the the owners of the game and it was pretty crude and pretty, uh, you know, pretty frustrating to use overall. So the easier method was just to crack the protection, which was just a simple kind of manual protection on, on the lens lock itself. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that, that didn't age particularly well. Um, and uh, this, yeah, this was kind of just the notes I made on it. Yeah, there was only 10 games that ever used the lens lock. Uh, you had to calibrate it. And sometimes what made it even more, frustrating was you were given the wrong wrong lens for the wrong game so each of the 10 games um i'm not saying each of them had their own lens lock but um sometimes you were given the wrong one for the wrong game which meant you could never get it to work but ultimately it was easy to crack if you had knowledge of uh, assembly language and you had a disassembler you would just simply just go to the routine and just you know just knock it out or just uh, you know, jump over it with assembly language or whatever it took. It was pretty easy to crack. And in my video that I did, I, I show how to just, you know, bypass the copy protection itself. So uh, there was I'm, a question in the chat. So yeah. was the intention that you had to do that every single time the game booted up? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it, yeah. So every time you wanted to play um, a certain game, you would have to go through that process. So it wasn't like a one-time thing and you activated the game. So you can see how, you know, how annoying it, it quickly became, right? Wow. So um, Code Wheels was another early form of copy protection. This is the one from LucasArts from, um, from one of their games. And you can see what's going on here. It basically, when the game would load, it would show a couple of different, you know, characters. And then you would basically uh, uh, line up the, um, you know, the characters that you saw on the screen. And then you would basically type out whatever was in, in, these, in these boxes here. Um, another pretty pointless copy protection. Um, this one was was even more pointless because you could just photocopy or replicate the code wheel if you were willing to take it apart, uh, or you could at least you know write it all down in a Excel spreadsheet or something, um, and you know just get all the combinations of that of that particular code wheel. But this one would, I guess, it would stop the the casual copying. Um, because if you did own a copy of the game or an original copy of the game, you didn't necessarily want to take your code wheel apart so your friend could play the game. I mean, I think, you know, you'd probably want to keep on to that. But again, very, very, very easy to crack at the end of the day. And another early copy protection was, was code sheets. And this was essentially, um, you can see what's going on here. It's basically saying, um, you know, at, at row G, uh, column three what is the combination um you know it's it's green green blue green right so you would you would you would key that in but the problem with this was not only was it really 
really frustrating to use. I mean, if you were colorblind and you couldn't look, you couldn't you couldn't see colors very well. It was, it's almost insulting that you are you know asked to 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 step through this. And if you were someone that had purchased the game, then you know it made it very very tedious. And honestly, it's 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 very frustrating and probably not something that's aged particularly well. Uh, another form was these code sheets. As you can see, it's not very easy to read, but they would put like the codes on a dark sheet of paper. And what that would do is it would kind of stop people from trying to photocopy the code sheets. But again, if you were determined enough, you could literally sit here and write all these codes down. You know what I mean? So it ultimately didn't really stop anything. And of course, you had you had pirates out there that were cracking these protections pretty much, you know, in about two hours anyway, and spreading them on at the time was bulletin board. So, you know, there were different ways that, that the, the, the software houses tried to thwart this, but, you know, they could tell that they were fighting a losing battle pretty quickly. One of the systems that I owned growing up was the Commodore Amiga and the Amiga was a, was a haven for piracy. I mean, you want to talk about copying discs. Um, this this tool here, Xcopy, was one that pretty much everyone that I knew had used. It was a disc duplicator. And sometimes in some instances, it was smart enough to crack protection for you without you doing anything. Uh, didn't always work. In fact, a lot of the times it didn't work. You would have to, you know, it, you have to wait for a crack to come out. But this, this tool got a lot of use um, pretty much by everyone. And ultimately, there were other methods that were, that had come out at the time. This was probably in the mid mid nineties or the early nineties. There were um, what was known as the copy lock protection. This was developed by Rob Northern, and he did two thousand games not only across the Amiga but the Atari ST and MS DOS. And essentially, the way that copy lock would work was he would obfuscate the thirty two bit key in a long disk sector, and a floppy drive could read that sector and extract the key out. But if you tried to copy the game, um, you couldn't actually access that sector or, and, and get access to that key without expensive disk mastering equipment. So that was, again, something that stopped the casual copying of games, but it wasn't really um, a big deal for the, you know, the experienced cracker that knew how to, um, you know, to, to crack protection pretty easily. Um, and the way you would do that was to use a freezer cartridge. So this, this tool here is the Amiga Action Replay. And it was probably the um, Swiss army knife of many crackers at the time. Essentially, you would load the game to the, the portion that you, you want to get to, maybe the copy protection check, and you would press that red freeze button on the top right. And essentially what that would do is it would break out of the game and give you access to the memory, the, the registers, um, the ability to um, manipulate the disk drive. You could do all sorts of things that you normally wouldn't be able to do. And this was this tool was inv invaluable to you know learning how to to make cracks of games. Um, essentially, with the action replay, it's it's easy to get that obfuscated track and get access to that key to unlock the uh, unlock the protection. So there was a question: uh, Is this what killed the G sixty four? I guess probably the rampant or simplicity in the copy protection. Uh, um, I, the the C sixty four was that the question? The, the question says G64, but I'm assuming maybe it's a typo. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about the G64, but if you mean the C64, I, I, think, I think ultimately the C64 was an 8-bit computer. And I think it just kind of, you know, became obsolete once the 16-bit micros had appeared. So, you know, one way or the other, I think that its days were numbered. But if it was G64 or, or maybe we didn't understand the question properly, um, you know, please let us know. But, oh, he um, confirmed. Yeah. So Commodore okay. 64. Yeah. So the Commodore 64, I mean, there was rampant piracy on the C64, but I think ultimately once the the 16 bit micros had, had appeared, no one really wanted to play the C64 anymore. And it's just that, you know, just that evolution or of, of, you know, microprocessors going from eight, eight bit to 16 bit to 32 bit, you know, to 64 bit type of thing. So um, so when when the uh, the game was cracked, you know, generally speaking, they would um, the crackers would would you know slap a, an intro on the, at the start of the game, and you know talk about how they cracked the game, and uh, this was usually the game that would get spread around worldwide on on bulletin board services. So you knew you kind of learnt the these names of these cracking groups. Um, like Cortex was a very popular group at the time. 
there are cracking groups that were around back in the days of the Amiga that are still around today that, that kind of continue to do this stuff. So they kind of, you know, it was almost like the, they were heroes almost because they would crack these games for you. Um, so you kind of got a sense of, of what, what the groups were doing just based on these kind of cracking or they, they were called cracktros. It was like an intro that they would put at the start of the game before the game itself would load. Uh, so piracy was, was a huge problem um, on the Amiga ST and MS-DOS. And, you know, as, as we just saw, many, many companies tried many methods and most of them would fail. Um, the, here's another one that I did a video on. This was Robocop 3. And this one used a dongle in the joystick port. And, you know, the concept of a dongle is, you know, the game would load and it detects the presence of a, a, a dongle, which is a, you know, a third party device that's not a part of the machine. And if it doesn't find it, the game doesn't load, right? Um, this particular game, Robocop 3, had a dongle that was, um, it seemed like initially it would be pretty sophisticated and very hard to crack, but ultimately it was uh, something that was cracked in about two hours. Um, it was quite simple. You know, like I said, experienced Amiga crackers knew exactly how to bypass protection. And, and that video that I did, let me just go back um, uh, on Robocop 3 kind of walks through that whole process. I actually talked to one of the crackers um, of, of the group that actually did the crack it's himself. So uh, kind of got got the the inside story from the horse's mouth, if you will. But um, even a dongle like this didn't really have any impact on on you know on on the games or the or the, the the rampant piracy that was going on at the time. Uh, the best way to mitigate piracy uh, was to convince the pirate that they cracked the game when they didn't. And a great example of this is Dungeon Master. Again, um, check out my channel. I, I did a a video on this uh, probably about two years ago now. And I would say one of my favorite my favorite videos that I've done, but this particular game was very, very um, uh, ingenious because it had, it had two forms of copy protection. It had weak and fuzzy bit protection and it had an unreadable sector with data on the disc. Um, as mentioned, the weak and fuzzy bit, essentially when you read data from a floppy disk, you're either reading ones and zeros in, in binary representation. And if you think about it, it's always going to read the same values every single time, right? But a weak and fuzzy bit essentially is indeterminate. So there may be some data on the disk that may read a one or it may read a zero, depending on you know how many times you read data off the disk. It's kind of in that in that indeterminate state. And that's what's known as a weak or a fuzzy bit, because that 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 bit itself is never is never locked in. It's never, you know, either a one or a zero, right? So a lot of crackers, when they found this game, you know, focused on the uh, unreadable sector because that was kind of the, I guess, the, the low hanging fruit, if you will. So, you know, there were a lot of releases of this game, Dungeon Master, and they crackers thought they had beaten the protection. But what actually happened was um, the fuzzy bit protection, number one that I mentioned, was not something that they were familiar with because it wasn't really apparent to them that it was even a thing on the disc. And I'm just kind of explaining here what the fuzzy bit protection is. So this, this value here in red zero, um, the next time I put my, my disc in the drive and read the data, it may be a one or it may be a zero, it may be a one, right? So it's an indeterminate state. And the, uh, the, the, the game developers deliberately made this happen uh, when they mastered, you know, the discs. So almost all the cracks worked, all the unreadable sector cracks had worked, but after a few hours of playing into the game, all these weird things started to happen. Um, and Dungeon Master, for those that don't know, is it's an early kind of first person dungeon crawler game. Um, and essentially you're kind of going through this dungeon and you're attacking, you're attacking the monsters. Um, so you're kind of clicking these icons, um, you know, you're punching, you're kicking and, and you're casting spells. You can also throw weapons, um, you know, range weapons at the monsters. Um, and in this scenario, even though this is a screenshot, um, in this scenario, when when um, you're playing a game that wasn't cracked properly, these weapons would say suspended in the air. So something was something was going on, right? So the crackers didn't know what was what was happening. Like this felt like it was um, it was just a um, I guess a part of the game, if you will. 
And essentially it was all because of the weak and fuzzy bit that they weren't familiar with. Eventually they realized that this weak and fuzzy bit protection was what was causing the problem. And it took them many months to actually find, find the protection and remove it from the game. And ultimately, from what I understand, it took about a whole year for the game to be properly cracked. And by that time, the company, Faster Than Light FTL, had made pretty much all their money that they were ever going to make on this game. And they didn't really lose anything due to piracy. So it was very ingenious. And one of the, I guess, one of the earliest success stories of copy protection that is kind of going around. And uh, check out my video on it. I kind of explain in a lot more detail about what was happening there. Um, so uh, moving on, let's get into the good stuff. I, I did want to mention the early home computer days because I think it's definitely important to do that. But um, what about game consoles? So the earliest one that I can recall would be the 10 NES lockout chip that was found on the NES. So essentially what's going on here is you've got a security chip and there's also a... A, the same chip on the NES console. And essentially it's a lock and key paradigm. If the, if the chip on the console can communicate with the chip on the cartridge and vice versa and, and handshake with each other, then it's good. It's a, it's a legitimate copy of the game. Now the 10 NES was easy to bypass as far as you could cut a few pins on the chip itself and just circumvent it. But to actually reverse engineer what the code was doing took 20 years. And um, again, another video that I've, 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 I've talked about um, in recent times. So check that out if you're interested in that. The Super NES also used the same lockout chip, but it was easy to bypass like the 10 NES was on the NES. And disc copiers became popular. This is a super wild card. And essentially what it would do is it would connect to the cartridge port and you would you would place your original cartridge on, on this connector here. And then you would insert a floppy disk into the floppy drive. And essentially it would just make a backup of the game onto the floppy drive. And then you could use the floppy drive to load the game without needing the cartridge. Essentially you're just copying, you know, making a backup of the game. So the thing about the Super NES was they realized, uh, many game manufacturers realized that the, the 10 NES chip or the security chip, as it was known at the time, was not enough. So some companies like Rare would add code to detect if a copy was being used as opposed to an original game. So how do you do that? How does the game know whether there's a copy that's being used versus the original cartridge? Well, the way that they would do it is they looked at what was known as SRAM or the static RAM. And that's usually, you know, the, 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 the piece of memory where the game is saved into. And because the, the, uh, the game copier is kind of like an all-in-one device, it needs to have a very, very large amount of SRAM to in incorporate the entire kind of suite of SNES games that have, had ever been released. So essentially what, what, what happened in this scenario is, and this is Donkey Kong Country, I think it's two, I believe. Um, essentially what would happen is they knew, they knew exactly how much SRAM the game had on, on the cartridge. And then they would just compare it to what was, what was detected. And if they found that there was a difference, then this screen would pop up saying, you know, you're, you're using an unauthorized device. Now they didn't specifically say you're using a copier or a, um, a copier like this, but they knew that something, something shady was going on. And that was kind of one kind of additional add on that, that, that some developers um, had, had done to, uh, to detect, you know, for copy protection. And a great uh, example of this that kind of took it a little further was, was Earthbound. Now, some of you folks may have heard about this story, but Earthbound actually had four layers of, of protection. The first one was region protection, which essentially means if you put plug the cartridge into another region system, you're going to get something that looks like this. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. Um, there's also the SRAM and copiers that we just talked about. So if the SRAM doesn't match what the game has, then you, uh, you, you'll see this screen come up. But there was also more than that. If one and two, if the, if, if the first two scenarios were, were circumvented, but they were still detected, 
then the game really started to messing with you. So how does that actually work? How do you circumvent them, but they're still detected? Well, basically, if you try to, you know, crack the protection or you, you, you patch the ROM to kind of bypass those checks, the game knew that it was being, you know, mod- it was modified. And I guess it was done by either checksums or, or CRCs or, or something along those lines, right? So if it knew that the, the protection was being bypassed, it still didn't, it, 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 it kind of made you believe that the game was, 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 the backup was working, but it actually didn't. And what it would do is it would throw a lot, uh, it would increase encounters in the game significantly. And you've, a lot of people may have heard this story, which is actually true because I've tested it myself. Ultimately, if you got to the end boss of the game, you would um, you would defeat him, but as soon as you did, it would delete your save file completely off the off off the uh, off the cartridge or whatever you were playing it on. And essentially, Nintendo kind of got their way and just wiped the save file completely clean, and you would have to start over again. So they knew that you were playing a, a backup copy of the game, but they didn't specifically um, mention anything after you know those two uh, two checks that I mentioned previously. So very, very sneaky, uh, you know, stuff that was going on there. Save file deletion was something that started to get incorporated into cartridge-based games when these uh, video game manufacturers and developers knew that people were trying to circumvent their their protection in the game. So there's a couple questions in the chat um, now that we're on the SNES. So uh, so one person said, uh, is there any actual benefit to having region lock games? It seems like it would just be more work to protect against it. Um. I think region locking back in the day was was used kind of like you know very similar to like DVD region protection and stuff. I think companies were because you know games cost cost different amounts of money in different countries. So I think though I think the video game manufacturers and 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 whatnot were trying to I guess regulate that uh, you know a, a little better, right? So like the the best example I can give you is in Australia uh, a Super NES game when I grew up cost probably about 110 Australian dollars, right? Pretty expensive. And over in the U S it was probably what 40, 50, 50, $50. So I think, you know, importing games from overseas, even though there's a cost associated to it, you could still save money by doing that. Um, you could save quite a bit of money. And if you started buying in bulk, you could, you could save a lot of money. So I think, I think these companies wanted to just kind of, you know, make sure that you were buying for the appropriate region, but there was always ways around that stuff anyway. Yeah. And then two more questions. Sorry. So, uh, so one question was how did hackers get past the SRAM? Um, they got past the SRAM, I guess. I think ultimately what they did was um, like I mentioned, they, they probably just somehow let the game know that it was using the right amount of SRAM, if that makes sense. So somewhere in the game, you know, it would check to say, you know, does, you know, is it, is it, does, the game has 4k of SRAM, but the, I'm detecting like 64k of SRAM, right? So I think somewhere in the game, they must have just patched that said, no, you know, we're, we're always going to return 4k. So, you know, it, it kind of gets past that that point. But I will say that I haven't actually specifically looked at, at some of that stuff in, in detail, but I would essentially think that they would, that's what they would have done. Or they may have just bypassed that check altogether and proceeded either way. Nice. And then the last one. Uh, so how did the SNES disc copier circumvent the add-on chip, like the Super FX or the SA1? Um, a lot of them didn't. And what you would have to do is plug in a, a Super FX game, you know, and then load another Super, Super FX game off disc. So back in those days, the concept of donor cartridges was, was, was pretty popular. And ultimately, I think that's probably the way they did it. Or the copier may have not even supported it. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so moving on, uh, Sega had its own copy protection um, that was known as the trademark security system. And essentially it was uh, something that, that would show this screen. But if there was uh, a game that was either being tampered with in some way or a third party that wasn't licensed by Sega tried to, um, you know, release a game on cartridge there's a big big story about accolade and sega that i've, I've covered in in my on my channel um if you're kind of if you show this screen to actually get past the the, the copy protection 
you're kind of admitting liability, right? So this was one of those ones where it's like, well, there wasn't really much copy protection. All you need to do is, you know, add the code to display the screen in your game. But by doing so, you're, you're kind of putting yourself, you know, you're, you're making yourself liable, right? For, for a lawsuit type of thing. And that's what Accolade did with Sega. Sega took Accolade to court, but they ended up losing um, because Accolade won on fair use. So there's look up, look up Sega versus Accolade. There's a lot of, lot of kind of documents around, around that. And I've covered it on my channel as well. So this one wasn't anywhere near as sophisticated as the SNES stuff, but it was more of a blanket legal piece of information that, that, you know, kind of kept, I guess, bootleggers away, but you know, if you had a, a copier for your Genesis or Mega Drive, it didn't really stop stop anyone from making copies of, of those games. So let's move on to CDs. Uh, we've kind of covered the early days. We've covered some cartridge-based stuff, but the good stuff now is when when we kind of got, got into you know um, CDs and DVD drives. This this is where things really got really got interesting. So you could easily copy a PlayStation One disc, right? So you could just put the disc in your PC and you could read the contents on any, any, any CD drive and they weren't encrypted at all. So you could, you could extract the executables. You could extract the, the assets from the game, all the music. So what was going on here? Well, the PlayStation one had a, uh, when it was mastered, it actually had what was known as this wobble data and any, CD burner at the time, and probably even now, is not capable of, of writing these wobble grooves back on a CD image. And that was the way that they handle their copy protection. They knew that if, you, if the disc that was inserted, the CD was inserted when it started up, it didn't detect the wobble, then it knew it was a copy or a backup. So it either wouldn't load or, you know, whatever. It would probably... Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't load, right? So um, this was pretty easy to circumvent. Mod chips came out that essentially just blocked the authentication. So they didn't even like bypass the wobble check. They just, when the authentication failed, the mod chip, the mod chip would just block it. Uh, so it was, it was pretty crude, but it worked, right? And they were cheap and easy to install. And like, I think everyone that I knew at the time that had a PlayStation one had a mod chip installed because like I said, they were very, very easy to do and everyone was doing them at the time. Right. So the PlayStation two, when that came out, um, that also had the wobble groove concept, but it also added so much more. And this isn't, this doesn't en encompass everything that the PS two was doing. There was actually a lot going on with the PS two, but essentially the PS2 had encryption on, on the disc. So the, the PlayStation 2 logo, you know, when you put a PS2 disc in and it pops up the, the PS2 logo, um, that was embedded as game data on the disc uh, and you needed a key to encrypt that data. So there was, there was kind of like three or four steps that you had to take to get all the data that was encrypted on the PlayStation 2 disc unencrypted and authenticated. So the system knew that it was a, an, an original disc, right? So real quick, so the logo thing, that's also similar to, I think the OG Game Boy did that, right? Yep, With a, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yep, uh, that's, that's a good point. We don't talk about the Game Boy in this, but yeah, the, the Game Boy had the Nintendo logo that would, that would come down you know, when you turned it on. And yes, there was a, um, a logo on the cartridge and basically if they didn't match up, then it was a copy. If they did match up, then it, you know, it would let you boot uh, into the game. And that was very similar to the, the Sega thing we talked about, the TMSS screen. You're kind of admitting, you know, licensed by Nintendo, right? You're, you're, you're kind of admitting that your, um, your game is, was licensed by Nintendo when it wasn't. So you're kind of admitting liability at that point. And, so very, very clever, you know, that Nintendo would do that with, with their, um, with their Game Boy there. And then, uh, sorry. So one other person asked, uh, might be a silly question, but who actually manufactured the mod chips? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not really familiar with it. I think, I think ultimately, um, you know, there was a lot that would come out of like Taiwan and Asian countries where that would be manufactured. But these days you can build your own mod chip pretty easily with, you know, with, with parts, um, but back in those days, I think 
you know, there was probably a lot that came from um, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, uh, Asian countries like that. There was a lot of that stuff going on. So the PlayStation 2 had a lot of different mod chips um, because it was a very successful machine. And Sony, they did their homework on on the system as far as security over the PS1, which was pretty easy to mod. The earliest devices, and this was something that I used to own back in the day, I kind of wish I still had it, was this Neo key. And this was very, very, very crude, right? You would plug it into a USB port and it would it would allow you with a um, with a disc with an original PS2 disc allow you to play backups, but it would only allow you to play certain backups, and I think it it, it wouldn't boot DVDs or anything like that. So it, it kind of only worked with maybe I'll say twenty percent of all games. But for me, it was enough. It was kind of cool that that it would work. But this wasn't a very good device. It was probably something useful for someone that didn't want to open up their system and perform a mod on. And modding a PS2, there was a lot lot involved, um, a lot of wires that were involved, and it took a little bit of work. But there were mod chips that came out for the PS2 that would allow you to play backups you know, from any region and, and whatnot. But it wasn't until later on where the uh, free McBoot uh, or free MC boot, whatever you call it, um, came out. And this was kind of a bit of a game changer, I, I would say. This was the, the soft mod exploit that allowed uh, a PS2 firmware um, to upgrade via memory card. So th the story here is PS2s were able to be updated with a, uh, a memory card and a CD. And Sony started doing this, but they quickly stopped as, from what I understand. But what they didn't realize was they they left the memory card uh, exploitable and ultimately people figured out a way to run an elf binary on on the memory card itself and hence you know this is the free Mc, mc boot or free Mc boot launcher that allows you to play backups um, has an elf binary launcher has a file system manager has all sorts of tools on there to you know to play your ps2 games and this is kind of the um, these days, this is kind of the, the kind of preferred method. And this was a soft mod and one of the very earliest soft mods that had come around. So there was nothing you needed to do to open up your, your PlayStation 2 um, with free MC boot installed on your memory card. You just plug it in and this would come up and you had the ability then to, um, you know, to run your backups and whatnot. So I've got an interesting story about the PlayStation 2 that I want to tell. And that has to do with the action replay. So some of you guys, uh, some of you folks may be familiar with the action replay disc. And that was a disc that you would put in to your PS2 and it had thousands of cheat codes on there. You would, you would pick the game that you wanted to cheat on. Let's say you, you picked um, Siphon Filter or something like that. Um, you pick the game and then it would say, okay, now insert your, your disc, your original disc. Right. And then from there, you know, all the cheats that you had, you had selected like unlimited lives, uh, extra ammo, you know, level skip, all that stuff was, was made available to you. But here's, what's interesting about this disc. It's, uh, it even says it on, on the disc itself, it's 100% unofficial. So this was not something that went through, you know, mastering at, at by Sony. Right. So how does how does a disc like this actually boot on an unmodified PlayStation 2? And that is an interesting story. Um, when I mentioned uh, previously, let me just go and come back, um, the watermark and wobble sectors on the PlayStation 2 disc. And this is actually uh, something that uh, was told to me and I verified. But essentially what they did was in order to get this, this disc to boot without a mod chip, and 100% unofficial, what they did was they took a game, they took an, an original game and the game was Crazy Taxi and they essentially just cut out, physically cut out the security sectors of a original game and applied it to their disc and it actually worked. Now, obviously it took some refinement, a lot of trial and error, but they were able to succeed. And a lot of people you know, they'll hear this and say, what are you talking about, man? That doesn't make any sense. But if you own an action replay disc and you put it into a PC drive, it's going to come up with the volume of Crazy Taxi. 
So it thinks it's a crazy taxi disc because it has the same security sectors and the same, you know, wobble sectors. But I mean, that's that's how they did it. It's uh, it's fascinating. Now I have heard reports that some other games may come up, but essentially that's how they tell were able to get this disc, an unofficial disc, booting on an un- unmodified system. Pretty interesting. What's funny is I actually owned an action replay for my PS2 way back in the day, and I remember encountering that. And it wasn't until, I guess like a couple of weeks ago that I, actually, I ever figured out like, why was it showing crazy taxi yeah. instead of actual things? Yeah, uh, they, use so sophistic- they use sophisticated cutting tools um, to basically transplant the sectors off the disc onto, onto theirs. And uh, it worked. I mean, like, like I said, a lot of trial and error, but Sony was unhappy, you know, as, as you can imagine, right? So moving on, um, let's talk about the Dreamcast. Now, the Dreamcast, a lot of people believe that the Dreamcast had no copy protection, right? But that's not exactly true because this, this thing here is the copy protection. That's the GD-ROM, right? So at, back in the day, nothing would re- you couldn't read a GD-ROM on a PC and you could, you could certainly not make a copy unless you had you know, a GD-ROM burner, right? Which was proprietary Sega equipment. So... There was actually copy protection on the Dreamcast, but it was just kind of implicit to the GD-ROM format itself. But there was an exploit found with with the Dreamcast, and that is the Mill CD format. Now, the Mill CD was a multimedia disc that had come out, and there was only a handful of them ever made. The most, I guess, the most um, well-known one is Space Channel Five that that came out with a Mill CD, and Essentially, it's just a ISO 96000 kind of format that you would put into your Dreamcast and it would boot. Um, So essentially, there was an exploit found in that particular mill CD format. And it was quickly realized that you could, by replicating the the kind of the boot process of the mill CD and utilizing that on just a blank CD, then you could boot any CDR onto a Dreamcast, essentially just bypassing the entire GD-ROM kind of copy protection that came with, with the Dreamcast. This is very well known, obviously. A lot of the times you'll hear that the Dreamcast has no copy protection and it's just easy just to burn discs. And it's true. Um, I think ultimately this, this was something that really... I mean, a lot of people say that piracy killed the Dreamcast. I don't necessarily believe that but it certainly didn't help and i guess you know sega did did fix the issue in a later revision of the hardware but this is going back before the days of you know easy updates to firmwares over the air and stuff like that where they can just fix it via a firmware update and whatnot so this definitely cost sega a lot of money in in lost sales no doubt about that so I have a quick question on this one. So uh, I remember this past year, there was that recent DVD exploit for the PS2 that kind of lets you boot anything just from the video disc drive. Is that yeah. similar at all in any way to this or is it? Um, the way that that works is I, I covered that recently as well. And so that's that's essentially, um, there, there was an exploit found with the PlayStation 2, the DVD player portion of that where it was able to boot unsigned code so with some i guess with some trickery fooling the disc into believing it's a dvd and then running a payload and then basically running you know an elf binary allows you to you know to boot into a game uh that was uh very very clever and yes i have covered that on on a video um in recent times not in the slide deck but yeah um definitely uh definitely something that is interesting to, to hear about so the gamecube Let's talk about the GameCube for a second. Um, The GameCube was not a secure machine and it was exploited thanks to Fantasy Star Online. So what actually, how did, how did like the hacking scene or the modding scene on the GameCube originate? Well, it all started from Fantasy Star Online and essentially for those people that that know PSO, it is a, uh, you know, it's an online, online game that you can play with four players. It originally came out on the Dreamcast and you could have a lot of fun with it. It's kind of, I guess, one of the earliest MMOs on on game consoles that came out and it was a lot of fun. Now, PSO came out for the GameCube and with a BBA or a broadband adapter, um, you know, you could connect online and to the, the PSO servers and play with your friends. But what 
the exploit here was that you could uh, you could change certain IP addresses. You could change DNS settings. You could change, um, you know, your, uh, your your subnet mask. Essentially, you could basically route the the data that PSO is sending over to a PC, right, to a local PC. And then, if you have a a tool that's listening for you know, those, those particular packets, um, essentially, then what you can do is th- you, you can push uh, executable files over the wire with with Fantasy Star Online, and that's. That, that was the, I guess, the first exploit that was found for the GameCube. Um, the beat with the, with, with the game and a broadband adapter and what was known as PSO load, you could then push these binaries over the wire. And it wasn't long before, oops, let me go forward. It wasn't long before people realized, well, the games themselves on the disc are not encrypted. So you have full access to the, the DVD drive or the mini DVD drive, and you can dump the games. And because you can dump the games, you can also dump the firmware. The GameCube was not a secure system. So originally what happened after the PSO hack had occurred was people realized that by modifying the firmware, which was also not very well protected, you could replace the firmware with a custom one that offered new features. And this was one of the earlier um, GameCube mod chips that came out. This is the Viper GC, and this is a firmware or an IPL. IPL stands for Initial Programming Loader that would come out for the GameCube that would give you features like the ability to, um, you know, play regular size DVDs on the GameCube by modifying the case itself. You could put a a, a regular DVD drive in and, and boot backups from that. Um, boot backups over the network, run homebrew, just, you know, kind of the, 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 the regular tools you would get with the custom firmware. This was, was something that the Viper GC would do. Um, region free, of course, was something that it would, would handle for you. Later on came the cheaper drive mods. So what the drive mods would do, and this is the Gen- Xeno GC, pretty popular one. Um, if you want to modify a GameCube these days, and you want to find a mod chip for it, there's millions of these on eBay. They cost about 50 cents to manufacture. People sell them for like 5 to $10 on eBay. But essentially, it's just a, a DVD drive mod that patches the DVD so backups can load. What this does not do, however, is allow you to, to um, play homebrew. But what it does do is allow you to load a homebrew loader and then from that homebrew loader, loader allow you to you know load into you know whatever you want, uh, and this all worked because the GameCube had no encryption. Once once hackers had figured out to access the DVD player, how to access the firmware, um, it was pretty much you know it was pretty much over at that point. It was only a matter of time. Now the ga- the GameCube is interesting because I want to talk about the DVDs themselves. They were very hard to copy in that sure you could rip them but you couldn't like make backups of them and this was because they had a very unique method to them they were marked with what's known as bca the birth cutting area and that's what this i'm not sure how this is coming through but that's what this area here is um and you can also see there are are these like little markings on the disc there's six of these around the rings of the disc and this is what the form the copy protection of the GameCube. So if you somehow did manage to make a backup of one of these discs, because you didn't have these markings and you didn't have the birth cutting area that the game was looking for, the, the, the GameCube was looking for, then it would not even let you boot into the game. And that was how they, I guess they, they, they tried copy protection originally, but like I said, the mod chips and the PSO loader was ultimately the way that that was circumvented. But I want to talk about our friends Daytel again for a second because we, we already know what they did with the PS2. But here's the thing. They did the same thing with the GameCube. This action replay disc, once again, is not officially licensed by Nintendo. There's no way Nintendo is going to license this game and master it and put those six markings on the disc, right? So how, did, how does this action replay disc boot on a unmodified Nintendo GameCube? Well, essentially, when I talked about this, uh, these notches and this BCA, this burst cutting area, um, essentially what they did was they captured the challenge response data uh, 
at each step of the boot process and just replicated it. So the GameCube itself isn't isn't looking for this marking at this distance from you know from sector one, right? It's not it's not it doesn't know anything about that the marking has to be in this place, right? But all all it's doing is knowing that there's there's a marking here and there's a marking here. And then there's the burst cutting area that has encrypted data. So by essentially just capturing the challenge response at each step with a mod chip, um, they were able to replicate a GameCube disc. And you can see here, you probably can't see it very well, but um, this is the action replay disc and this is a GameCube disc. This does not have any markings on it at all. And the GameCube disc does. And essentially they emulated the authentication process without needing um, you know, expensive DVD mastering or you know, Nintendo's buy-in. So that's how the action replay disc was, you know, would work without a mod chip. Now, you're probably wondering, well, why weren't, the, why weren't other discs made? Why, why isn't there um, you know, more games that were kind of replicated in the same way? Well, I think ultimately it goes back to, um, goes back to mod chips and, and things like this. Once, once you have something like this that costs almost nothing People don't really care about, you know, a a copy of a, a disc anymore that that you know that you would put into a, a unmod, unmodified system. I think ultimately, the protection has been defeated, and there's no real reason to do that. But the action replay came out at a time where um, mod chips were still very much in their infancy, and ultimately, you know, Daytel wants to make money, right? So they want they want their cheat devices on every system that they possibly can. So I do think that's an interesting story to tell that, you know, they tell, they, uh, they also were able to get, get around the protection on the, on the GameCube. So there's a question in the chat. Um, are there still a lot of homebrew GameCube games out there? Uh, there's a, there's a scene that's still around. It's pretty small. Um, and it's kind of been, I'll say encapsulated into the Wii scene because obviously the Wii and the GameCube have a lot of similarities. There's a lot of homebrew that's been developed on the GameCube that does run on the Wii because they're compatible. But there, there's a small but um, but very passionate homebrew scene on the GameCube, uh, I will say. But the Wii is a lot, obviously a lot bigger. Yeah, for the GameCube, I would recommend, uh, there's a tool called Swiss that is an awesome homebrew app that yep. uh, it does it is crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, and just quickly on, on Swiss, um, going back to... Going back to this, right? This is the drive mod. So um, normally what you would do is you would install a drive mod like this and then you would have Swiss on a, a CD and then you would just load Swiss and then from there you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. So this chip by itself was pretty worthless. It couldn't do anything, but if you had this and Swiss on a CD, then you kind of had unlocked the keys to the castle, if you will. So let's talk about my favorite console, the original Xbox. Uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting. So the Xbox was hacked in about three weeks. Uh, it came out in November of 2001. And Andrew uh, Wang, otherwise known as Bunny, had built a device, essentially just a, a, a data sniffer that kind of sat on the motherboard. And he was kind of poking around seeing what the system could do because ultimately he wanted to learn more about the Xbox because it seemed like that it was just a PC with some type of encrypted firmware on, on it. And he wasn't far off. So he built a device that could extract the BIOS. And when he extracted the BIOS, uh, it was encrypted. But he quickly found that there was a hidden key that was not very well hidden. And um, he was able to get access to that key. And that key itself wasn't very unique either because it was in every single Xbox that you would buy at the store. So it wasn't a per console key. It was just, just a global key, right? So with that particular key, then it was possible to extract the firmware. And once the firmware was extracted, that's when mod chip manufacturers got really, really excited about it, right? So the initial mod chips that came out for the Xbox original, the OG Xbox were these monstrosity 29 wire mods. And I actually, this is not my photo, but I, I had one of these mods originally. Um, I remember trying to solder 29 wires on my motherboard and um, it was not fun, but I, I managed to get it to work and it did everything that you would expect it to do. It was essentially a BIOS replacement. So 
Bunny had figured out how to extract the BIOS and decrypt the BIOS. So mod, mod chip manufacturers would then patch the BIOS and allow things like unsigned code execution, region free, the ability to play the uh, use the DVD play without the, the DVD dongle that was needed. Um, just just things like that that would allow a lot more freedom as you know as a as an owner as a consumer of uh, an original Xbox. So this is the original 29 wire. I think it's this is the extender or the Enigma. I'm not really sure which one it is. It's one of the two. Um, this is the flash chip. So basically, a a custom flash or a custom BIOS is on this chip, and these wires essentially just circumvent the the firmware that's on board on the on the Xbox itself and allows for for code execution. Didn't take very long for these chips to start appearing. I want to say probably within about four months after release of the original Xbox, we started to see these mod chips coming out and being sold. Now, the second generation mod chips on the original Xbox were a lot more sophisticated and a lot less wires. This particular port here is the LPC port, the debug, debug header. And this is what Microsoft used in the factory to either do diagnostics on the Xbox but they were also able to flash firmwares on. So when, when the systems were at the factory being, being ready to get launched for retail, um, someone would interface into the LPC header and then flash the BIOS onto, onto the system and then quickly test it and make sure it all worked and then they would ship it off to, to retail stores. So it was quickly realized that it was a much easier just to tap into the LPC port to install a mod device and this is this is this is mine as well this is the aladdin chip so this is kind of the second generation which essentially just kind of wires up into the lpc and takes over the the lpc debug header a lot easier than the 29 wire mod chips that originally had come out but essentially has the same result as far as what what features it, it can have now a retail xbox can't flash the bios this is the bios chip here by the way um, so if you try to, if you do, let's say you do, um, you know, log into, or you, you do run um, some homebrew on your Xbox and you want to flash your BIOS, you can't do it because it's, it's locked down. It's read, it's read only, but Microsoft weren't very smart in, in that regard. They ended up basically having two uh, points on the motherboard that you could bridge to open up read, write access to, um, to this chip here. And it's called the uh, the TSOP. This is known as the TSOP chip. Uh, and by bridging two points on the motherboard, uh, it would enable read write mode or write mode. And then you could essentially just flash your custom BIOS on this chip. So you didn't even need a mod chip at that point. Um, you still needed a way to 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 run Homebrew initially, but once you had launched Homebrew and then flashed this chip with the custom BIOS, that was it. You didn't need to do anything else. You could you could just you know. Um, take away the mod device or, or what, whatever. So very, very easy to do. And this is something that I, I do on, on my systems. Uh, it's not necessarily the preferred way because that let's say you do have a bad flash, then you pretty much you know bricked your system. Uh, you can still recover from it. There are ways to do that, but there's definitely risks involved uh, in this. If you connect a mod device um, that you flash to instead, then this is not tampered with so you can always come back to this but the TSOP was very popular and very very cheap and easy to do obviously later on uh, the soft mods were popular and this is splinter cell and this this is all mine so this is splinter cell this is a uh, xbox uh, you know controller connector port and this is a usb connector and this is a usb key essentially because soft mods, um, well, save files on the Xbox were not signed. So there was no, there was no encryption. They weren't signed in any way at all. And it was kind of a, a bit of an oversight by Microsoft that they didn't sign save files. It was possible to run bu buffer overflow exploits. So what is a buffer overflow exploit? Well, the best example I can give you is Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. When you first load up the game, There'll be something in something at the start of the game um, that will say, "Type in your name, or type in your profile name, or just type in the name, right?" And that that then creates your save file based on that name. Um, it's one of those classic examples where if you put in too many characters, you type in too many characters versus how many characters that the game actually expects you to have. There was no bounds checking at all 
in in the game so that could then have unintended unintended side effects and consequences essentially allowing for a custom payload and then obviously loading into a uh, you know into unsigned code execution right so that's that's kind of what what i mean by buffer overflows so it was found that with certain games there were save files that had buffer overflow exploits and it was possible then um, to essentially just copy a, a save file to your Xbox hard drive by utilizing something like this. And then when you loaded that game Splinter Cell and you loaded your save file, uh, ultimately what would happen is it would, it would you know, run, run its custom payload and then run its homebrew. And usually that would be a custom dashboard that had an FTP server on it. And from there you could start uploading things to your Xbox and you had you know, you had full access to the system. Back in those days, there was no hypervisor. There was no, you know, um, access permissions. It was all kind of root level permissions. So once you had access to the system, that was it, you were, you were in. So it was really up to you what to do next. So soft modding is, is very popular and it's still very popular to this day. It doesn't, it does not require you to obviously open up your system and install a mod chip or run the risk of flashing your TSOP and, Copies, copies of Splinter Cell and Mech Assault and some of these other games that are out, they're still very cheap to buy. And, you know, if anyone, most people that I talk to that want to mod their Xbox original, I usually, you know, take them down the soft modding path. It's pretty easy to do. So actually, funny story about that. Uh, so I had an OG Xbox that I got off my friend once he got a 360 when it first came out. And I remember I didn't have any simple way of getting myself the USB uh, controller port. So there was a, another option of doing a hot swap mod where I guess basically the the hard disk is, so for people that don't know, the, X, the OG Xbox has an internal uh, IDE hard disk that's encrypted normally. And during boot, very briefly when the kind of globby boot logo is going, it, it unlocks temporarily and then relocks again. But there was a hot swapping trick where if you had your Xbox opened, you could kind of have the hard drive sitting there and then just during that split second that it's unlocked, disconnect the IDE power, uh, the IDE data and then stick it in. But definitely a bad idea because <laughs> you can totally screw up your Xbox. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of, lot of that stuff that was going on. Um, hot swapping of hard drives and, and whatnot. It was, it, was, it was pretty interesting times for sure. Um, flashing firmwares on the DVD player and all sorts of different things going on. But Ultimately, once once the soft mods were discovered, which didn't take long, that was kind of the the the, the tried and true method. I think that most people you know fall back to um, for running unsigned execution on their OG Xboxes. So let's talk about the Wii. So we talked about the GameCube and how much of a um, security mess that was. Uh, Nintendo actually learned a lot from the GameCube, and they secured the Wii pretty well at least initially, at least for the first few years, it was a device that was, you know, had a lot of security around it. Um, on the right-hand side there, you know, there was no direct access to Broadway. Broadway was one of the chips inside the Wii. Uh, everything was encrypted. Um, the, uh, the Broadway chip can't access memory directly. Uh, all the games, apps, everything must be signed. So on the GameCube, nothing was signed. So they did that. They did their homework on the Wii, but as we know, history will tell us that they they still missed out in some very crucial areas. Um, the initial mods that came out, or the initial hacks that came out for the Wii, were based on the the earlier GameCube drive mods. So essentially, they took the same the same kind of drive chips that that you saw on the GameCube, not not one to one the same, but that concept of doing a drive mod would also work on the Wii. So the Wii key was uh, one of the earlier mods that was a drive mod that would allow you to play backups, um, copy disks and whatnot, but it wouldn't allow you to play homebrew, right? So um, this was purely for, for piracy to, you know, to, to make backups of games and stuff like that. It didn't have any, any homebrew ability whatsoever. Um, and essentially it just replicated the, you know, the, the drive mod from the GameCube. Now, the Wii was a, uh, a secure system, but there was, there was a problem. And that was the GameCube mode that ran in a protected sandbox. So as you, as you know, the, the Wii, if you put a, a GameCube disc in, will boot into its GameCube sandbox. 
and allow you to play GameCube games. One of the one of the backward compatible pieces that the um, Nintendo has 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 given you know its fans over the years. Now, it was discovered that parts of iOS, which is the so when you turn on the Wii and you see the you know the the the, the um the I guess the the classic Wii screen. Um, that's known as iOS. That's kind of the Wii's operating system. Not to be confused with iOS from Apple. Um, not really sure how that actually worked, by the way. But uh, the Wii's OS is called iOS, and it was discovered. You know, once once you're in GameCube sandbox mode, that they weren't mem. You know, mem zeroing out the uh, the RAM. Right. So it was discovered that portions of iOS, which is the Wii's operating system was still in the Wii's memory. And taking it even further, um, this is the the infamous Team Tweezer story, by bridging um, address lines on the uh, the memory chip would expose different parts of the iOS memory. And by painstakingly bridging different points with a pair of tweezers, they were able to extract the entire iOS as a, as a dump file, including the per console keys and a lot of other really interesting pieces of information. Now, this wasn't enough just to say that the Wii was hacked. They, they had iOS and they had some keys, but how do you, how do you run homebrew at that point? Right? So how do you, you know, how do you kind of take advantage of that? Well, with that information, they were quickly able to create what's uh, known as a save game exploit, very similar to what we saw with, the um, Xbox uh, Splinter Cell, the Wii was very much the same in that its save games were not were not signed, and essentially it would just basically be able to fake sign any app that could be used. Right, so they utilized um, Twilight Princess, a save game from that, and then from there you were able to yeah it would fake sign any app that would run on on iOS the uh, the Wii's uh, operating system. And that's kind of the original Twilight hack that um, some folks may have heard of before, and it was done by um, it was done by Team Tweezers, and that's kind of where they got their name based on the the Tweezer hack that that uh, that I showed you previously. So it took a couple of years, but they were able to figure out a way to get access to um, to the Wii, and that's essentially how how that all began, and that's kind of the birth of the Homebrew Channel. Um, on the Wii, there was a specific channel that they was created called the Homebrew Channel, and then that would allow you to launch into your homebrew, which obviously consisted of homebrew games, emulators, media players, you know, you name it. The Wii was a pretty alive and kicking homebrew scene for many, many years. Um, once the Twilight hack was discovered, um, there was a lot going on. The Wii obviously is a very versatile system. It also has of course, SD card um, built into it. Um, so you can just plug in SD cards. Uh, it also has USB. So there was a lot of lot of activity going on with the Wii homebrew scenes for many years. Moving on to the PS3. The PlayStation 3 was unhackable for its first three years until they removed Linux or other OS. And once Sony had removed other OS... Um, everything changed. Now let's let's go back for a second. So when the PlayStation Three came came out, one of the features that they had announced as a part of the PS Three was the ability for it to run Linux. And Sony is no stranger to this. In the past, they've they've opened up their systems to um, to make them more computer based. The PlayStation Two had uh, Linux distribution that you could, you could run. It was an official uh, distribution with a mouse and keyboard. Um, you could purchase from Sony. There was also, um, I think it was basic that came out uh, as well for the PlayStation two. So they're no strangers to, you know, opening up their systems and allowing, you know, allowing them to be used, I guess, as more traditional PCs and Sony allowed uh, Linux to run yellow dog Linux on their PS three for many years. And it was just a sandbox where you know tinkerers, hackers could mess around, and and you know because it was very tightly in a sandbox, and the PS3 had a hypervisor, it didn't seem like it was going to be um, something that that would be of a concern. But it quickly ended up being something that they removed because um, George Hot's Geo Hot, uh, for those people that may know that name, was tinkering around with other OS. And he was 
playing around with the hypervisor. He was, I'm not sure if you got hypervisor access, but he was, he was trying to hack the hypervisor on Linux and Sony was, was kind of looking at what he was doing because he was making blog posts, pretty frequent blog posts on his adventures of hacking the PS3. And I think the way that Sony ultimately responded to, you know, stamping out security or fixing, fixing the security problem was just to take other OS away completely. Hence the ability to, to not, you know, just taking it, taking it away. Right. So um, once that happened, um, it was not a good look for them. They obviously went through a class action lawsuit, which I believe um, is still being paid out to this day, which is hilarious. Uh, I got a check from Sony for $6 and 50 cents, probably about five or six years ago now, but um, they, they basically offered to pay out of court and, you know, cover the, cover the losses of other OS being removed. But once other OS was removed, um, different hackers and different groups rallied around to defeat its hardware. And it was really kind of the catalyst for the PS3, PS3 security being put under the microscope. Before that, it was kind of dubbed the unhackable console for years. And uh, we'll get to the three, uh, Xbox 360 shortly, but um, the Xbox 360 had suffered a couple of different um, exploits even before the PlayStation 3 was, was hacked. So moving on, after OS, uh, other OS was removed, it only took six weeks. And the first of, of what we saw was the PS3 jailbreak. And essentially, you would turn the PlayStation on and with a USB dongle device with a custom payload, it would allow for unsigned code execution to run on your PS3. And it did this, uh, let me just go back. It did this in such a way that essentially what it did was it made the this device here believed that it was a uh, i think a, a five port usb hub was connected to the system and essentially just kind of spoofed a bunch of things and ultimately allowed for that code execution to run so the ps3 jailbreak was the earliest earliest forms of of hacks that was done to the playstation 3 it could run unsigned code it could run homebrew but it, it wasn't really enough for Sony to, um, to get, you know, too concerned at that point. But what really ended up um, getting them concerned was Team Tweezers, our friends from the Wii days, were now called Fail Overflow. And they were able to discover the PlayStation 3's private key. And obviously with the private key means that you can sign any piece of unsigned code and then have that code run on your PlayStation 3 because it believes it's it's obviously a signed piece of code. And from there means that you can build a custom firmware and then sign that custom firmware, which means you can install that custom firmware. And then that custom firmware allows you to run unsigned code execution and all sorts of things. So you didn't even need the PlayStation 3 um, a jailbreak at that point if you if you had that at that point. So the PlayStation 3 scene was was very popular for a while when this was going on. Now Sony did did fix this um, after the, I think it's the 3.55 firmware. Um, but in recent times, there have been PlayStation 3 exploits as well that have come um, allowing you to, to modify your systems. But that's how the PS3 was, was ultimately hacked. It was um, a very much a coordinated effort from different groups, you know, that were pretty annoyed that uh, Sony had taken this, this feature away from them. I think if they had kept it in, it probably wouldn't have got to where it was. Maybe it would have, you know, it's hard to really speculate, but ultimately that's, that's where the, uh, the PlayStation three uh, modding scene and, and the hacks had, had appeared from. So the Xbox 360, while the PlayStation three was, was being dubbed unhackable, there was a lot going on in the, th in the Xbox 360. A lot of people were very interested in the 360 and it was obviously the very easy to modify the Xbox original. So people were interested in, well, what did, what did Microsoft do differently this time? And they did a lot. They, they secured the system very, very well. Um, but again, there were a couple of things that happened that, that obviously, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss here, but the first one was the DVD exploit. So the Xbox 360 came with a hypervisor and it came with e-fusers. What that means is, when you upgrade a firmware on an Xbox 360, there are these electronic fuses on the CPU itself, on the die chip that will blow one at a time, which means that you can never go back to a previous version of firmware. And this was a great security 
um, flaw that they had they had basically patched, right? They had fixed. So you could never go back to a firmware that was exploitable. If there was an exploitable firmware, you can only go forward. And this was a very clever thing that Microsoft had introduced into the Xbox 360, as well as other security that we'll, we'll discuss here shortly. But one area there where they didn't really do much homework on was the DVD drive. Now the DVD drive was still ran an encrypted firmware and it was encrypted by the per console CPU key on the system. So you couldn't just run a general purpose, you know, custom firmware and flash it onto your DVD player. Um, what you would need to do is extract your CD key from your Xbox 360, then extract the firmware um, and then, you know, install that CD key onto a custom firmware and then reflash. So there were definitely some steps that were taken there. But the DVD exploit essentially worked if you were able to get access to your CD key, which wasn't difficult to, to figure out how to do that. And I'll get to how that was accomplished here in a couple of slides. But it was once you extract, once you were able to get a hold of your DVD key, you could then flash a custom firmware on your Xbox 360 drive that fooled the system into believing that an original disc was inserted. And there were a lot of firmwares that had come out over the years, um, such as the iExtreme firmware and uh, Commodore Forever was a well-known uh, hacker in the scene that was basically building these custom firmwares. There were many different drives that came out for the Xbox 360 different manufacturers um, were making different drives. So essentially firmware, custom firmwares were made for every single drive on the market, even up to the latest models that came out in you know 2012, um, there was, there was a, a exploit available for it. So this was a pretty popular exploit for the Xbox 360. It was the original one that had come out. But again, like the, um, the one we saw previously with the drive mod on the GameCube and the, uh, the Nintendo Wii, was not able to play homebrew. So this was essentially a piracy tool to play backup copies of discs. So there was no easy way, well, there was no way of playing homebrew at all. It was just essentially replicating a DVD Xbox 360 disc and the system believed that it was just an original disc. So real quick, someone asked, um, so back on the updating with the fuse blowing, uh, yep. how many fuses did they have to have on the CPU to be able to blow them as you were updating? Uh, I'm not really sure about the EFU stuff um, in too much detail. It's definitely um, something that I want to cover in a video because I think the concept of EFUs is, is, is interesting. Um, but I guess my short answer is I don't really know the answer to that, but uh, there, yeah, was, there was, there was, a you know, there was um, quite a bit of sophistication when it came to blowing EFUs. It wasn't just like, you know, one bit, was was you know was removed or something like that right there was a lot going on there so mm -hmm. um it was quite sophisticated from what i understand interesting interesting yeah so the dvd um exploit we saw previously although that would work it it wasn't really it, it wasn't available until you could run some type of unsigned code and extract your cpu key based on that code that you had written, right? Because there was no easy way to get access to a CPU key on the Xbox 360. But you could do so if you were somehow able to exploit the hypervisor and get, you know, those level the hypervisor or higher level, you know, permissions, right? To, to get access to your CPU key. Now, there was a hypervisor exploit that was found and it's, you may have heard the, uh, heard the name before, but the King Kong hack was, the originator of the hypervisor exploit. And in one of the really early kernel revisions, in fact, I think it was the first one, 4532, there was an exploit with um, some shaders that were found on the King, the King Kong game on the Xbox 360 that essentially allowed you to get hypervisor exploit, hypervisor privileges to your system and then extract your CPU key. Um, obviously the, the kernel 4532 was quickly patched and I think it was patched even before most people had realized that it was patched, but it was um, something that was utilized in future uh, exploits that I'll get to here in the next slide. And I just kind of made a note here that, you know, e-fuses once, once the fuse has blown, you can never go back. So you, you can never go back to 4532, at least via traditional means, but 
Well, what we'll talk about here next is the, I guess the JTAG hack that came out later on. And that was an exploit on the SMC or the system management controller to enable the JTAG ports. And what this did was it, it opened up the door to basically build a custom firmware that had 4532 built into it. So it would allow you to run unsigned code and get that hypervisor access. But you could also um, my, you know, manage that, that 4532 with the latest firmware. So the way firmware updates worked, and I'm a little fuzzy on this, so you know, someone, someone may know more than me, but um, every firmware that came out for the Xbox 360 would also contain 4532 inside of its inside of its kind of you know firmware package, so they utilized that to open up the door for unsigned code execution and hence the the JTAG hack, and the JTAG hack was kind of the earlier version of a hypervisor exploit that allowed you to get access to the system. Uh, later on, the Microsoft had patched the JTAG hack. It only worked up to a certain revision of of the of Flash. Uh, so people tended to just keep their systems at a, at a low firmware revision. And normally when that happens, you kind of miss out on being able to play the latest games and, and what have you. So if you did have a JTAG of all Xbox, um, there was still obviously ways to play pretty much everything, but you were kind of, you know, crippled in that, in that environment. You could certainly not connect to Xbox live without being asked to perform a system update and, and, and things like that. Later on, there was a RGH hack, which was a reset glitch hack. And uh, I kind of wrote this down. This is the quote of how it works. So it's explained a lot better than I could ever explain it. But essentially what it does is when the Xbox is booted up with this piece of hardware, it sends tiny reset pulse pulses to the CPU. And what happens is the CPU itself slows down um, for a short period of time. And normally when this happens, the, the CPU will reset itself or the system will reset itself. But this piece of circuitry um, slows down the processor. It doesn't reset it. And it basically exploits an issue that was found in a mem compare function. And essentially what it does, it, it patches that mem compare function to return no differences. And essentially it just kind of glitches the, uh, the bootloader and then allow you to run into uh, into home uh, unsigned code execution, right? So this is what's known as the reset glitch hack, and this here is what's known as the glitch chip. And this is kind of, if you talk about modding an Xbox 360 in you know in this day and age, you're going to want to, you're going to do the RGH hack, the the JTAG hack that we saw previously is it's kind of obsolete, and it's a lot more tedious anyway. Um, there's probably not really many JTAGable. Xbox 360s out there anymore because most of them have been updated to a later firmware anyway. But the reset glitch hack is kind of more the, um, the you know, the, the standard these days of, of modding, modifying the, the 360. Uh, I, I did say at the start, I was going to talk about handhelds, but I do want to talk about the PSP because it is um, an interesting one as well. So the original Sony PSP was released in Japan before it hit North America. And it came with retail firmware 1.0. And 1.0 was not patched in any way to run unsigned code. So you could run unsigned code on an original Japanese model 1.0 Sony PSP. And I remember this very well. This is my PSP. Um, I imported a Japanese PSP that ran 1.0 from uh, I think it was Play Asia or um, or Lick Sang or some some place like that back in the day, and to my extreme surprise, um, it did run unsigned code. I was quite shocked because I'd never seen that before. Uh, it was quickly patched in 1.5, but there was another exploit that was easily found. And on your memory card, if you had the name of the game or the name of the homebrew that you were running, and then you replicated the same folder name and put a percent sign after it, for whatever reason, um, it was able to run unsigned code. And I think this was something Sony, they quickly tried to patch 1.0, um, but they didn't do a great job, I guess, pushing that, that patch out. And they ended up with this 1.5, they call it the folder exploit. And that's how that was discovered. Now, since 
there was a major cat and mouse between hackers and Sony that went on literally for years on the PSP scene. So Sony would bring out a new firmware and patch the previous exploit. And then uh, Dark Alex or some PSP hacker would then bring out a new firmware that would that would supersede that. Um, Sony then began offering in, um, new features to their firmwares to entice people to upgrade to the latest firmware. And they also started blocking the ability to play games. So when you put a PSP game in, it wouldn't let you play the game because it would say you need to upgrade your firmware before you can play the game. Um, but it didn't stop the hackers coming up with custom firmwares to essentially circumvent all that stuff. So there was a lot of back and forth for many, many years. And things were kind of at a bit of a stalemate. Um, but ultimately what really blew open the PSP scene later on was the Pandora's battery. And this was something that was found where you could essentially restore and brick any, uh, you could restore a, a bricked PSP um, or you could downgrade it to any PSP firmware you, you wanted to, uh, to downgrade to. There was no eFuse technology or anything like that in the PSP. So you could essentially go back to, um, let's say you did upgrade to a firmware or the latest firmware and it wasn't exploitable you could just use a Pandora's battery to go back to a previous version that was exploitable. And this was something that was um, an absolute game changer in, in the scene at the time. Uh, these days, pretty much like most kind of exploits from, from, from that era, it's possible just with a simple um, soft mod uh, memory, you know, put a couple of files in the memory card to exploit any model PSP without any difficulty and pretty much have you know, full access to everything. And that's open source. So there are ways to uh, modify your PSP as mentioned, and things are, uh, are open source these days. Uh, the last, I guess the last one I wanna talk about today is the Nintendo Wii U. And this is essentially a very clever exploit that allows for emulators and homebrew to run um, now you may be thinking, well, did they kind of leverage something from the Nintendo Wii? Uh, maybe initially they may have done that, but the Wii U exploit simply works by modifying a, a game from the eShop and uh, injecting its own code inside. And from there, it opens up um, the ability to run to run homebrew. And the Nintendo Wii U is something that uh, Nintendo, you know, continues to bring patches out for not not very much these days, but every once a year or so they'll bring out a new firmware revision. But it's not something that they can easily uh, fix. I mean, I guess the way that they can address this is to close down the the eShop, uh, which would then obviously have ramifications on, in you know, code injection at that point. And that's it. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to pass it back to, uh, to, to Nima for a minute um, and just catch my breath. But um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so, so I myself, I wasn't super active in a lot of these scenes. So it's, it's really cool for me to hear just from someone's perspective, just, you know, what is the mechanism behind it? What was the motivation? Putting everything in the context. I think the other thing is individual consumers might have one console and you learn the hacking scene for that one console. But I think this like global map of what happened when it, it really makes things fit really nicely. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Uh, so there was a couple of questions that I wanted to save for the end for the Q and a, um, if you still have some time. Uh, so, so the first yeah. question was uh, what motivated you to start a YouTube channel? Um, I think yeah, it's a good question. I, I started a YouTube channel back in 2007, uh, a long, long time ago. And I really didn't have any purpose for the channel. Like if you go back and watch my earliest videos, um, it's just kind of random Call of Duty gameplay and stuff, right? So then I kind of got into um, arcade, arcade, um, arcade cabinets and arcade machine collecting for a while. So the channel didn't really have any, I guess, any point to it for a long time. Um, but sometime in about, I want to say 2015, 2016, I started looking at the landscape of YouTube and I saw what I 
what I had as far as, you know, the equipment that I had. And I had a lot of stories to tell, right, about um, the homebrew scene and, and things like that. And no one was really covering it at all at the time. Um, and there were some, some people that were, that were covering, you know, mining and homebrew and stuff. Um, and they were doing a pretty good job. But I just kind of felt like, you know, I, I think there's some really interesting things, interesting stories to tell here. And I, I, I kind of want to start getting serious and start telling my story about it. So that's kind of when it all started. I mean, I think I really got started doing YouTube in 2016. I got serious about doing it. And yeah, I mean, you know, the rest is history, I guess. It's, it's, been, it's been a fun ride. But um, I guess to answer the, the question, it was never really something that I intended to do, to set out to do. Um, it always started out to be just a bit of fun. And over time, it just kind of turned into something a little more serious. And now it's kind of part of, you know, what I do for, you know, for my business and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, that's probably the best way I can answer that one. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so someone asked if someone wanted to get into video game console hacking, like or video game slash console hacking, what would be a good place to start? Um, I would say it's a good question. I mean, I think for me, I wouldn't go down the rabbit hole of like hardware mods and stuff. I'd probably start simple and pick a system that is easy to mod, like easier to soft mod. And there are ones you can, you can do. Um, I, I hate to say it, but the Nintendo switch is a very easy system to, to mod these days. Um, assuming you can get an exploitable one. Um, but let's say you don't want to go down that path, you know, go back a little further. Original Xbox is, is one that I recommend to people. Um, even though it's, it's quite old these days, it's very easy to soft mod and it's got a very, very good homebrew community, but even the Nintendo Wii U, we kind of touched on at the end has, uh, has a great scene as well. The, the soft mod that you do for that is, is pretty easy. There's, it's not really that complicated, just follow some steps. So, uh, and of course the handhelds, you know, mm -hmm. um, the DS, the 3DS, they have, they have great scenes as well. Um, very easy to mod those devices too. So I guess, you know, my answer is, you know, if you're aligned with a certain system or if there's a certain system that you like, that's your favorite, um, there's a pretty good chance there's a homebrew and modding community around it. So maybe just jump in and take a look and see, see what they got, you know? Nice. Nice um and actually so so it's not in these slides but for anyone that's interested in potential handheld mods i know dimitris did a recent video on 2ds or i, I think you did a 3ds yep, uh, yep but same same mod mm -hmm. uh there so there's another question uh what cryptographic algorithms were generally used by game companies to verify the integrity of their games and firmware um, i don't know if I you think, know this one um it's, it's a general question i don't know specifics but i mean like on the on the xbox og xbox you know they used um they would use like uh Shar and, and rc5 and and things like that um i think on the 360 would be fairly similar i mean you know crypto as we know it today is so much more sophisticated right um and that's one of the reasons why the xbox one has yet to be has yet to be hacked and, and things like that so back in those days it was you know it was probably Shar and, and rc5 type type encryption that was used Nice. Uh, and then, so this is actually an interesting philosophical one, or I guess, I don't know, philosophy, but uh, so what do you think the ideal balance is between letting users execute their own code on console for homebrew versus protecting IP and security? And the example that they gave uh, is the Xbox Series X or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, if, if you give, if you give people a sandbox where they can play, play in, um, I think that's enough, right? Like, Sony did that with the PS3 yeah. and it worked for them for a while until, you know, um, they, they took it away. Microsoft offer the developer developer mode um, where you can boot into a completely walled off sandbox and you can run, you know, you can run um, homebrew on, on that, on that part of the system completely in, you know, in a vacuum. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why the Xbox One and the Xbox Series X and Series S don't really have people that want to exploit that system because it kind of takes away that desire to do so anyway because you can already run um, emulators on there. You can already run Homebrew on there. So there's no reason to spend you know the thousands of hours trying to find a way to exploit these systems. So I think... 
I think ultimately Microsoft are definitely doing the right thing. Um, but ultimately to answer that question, yeah, if you can give your consumers, your customers a sandbox to play around in, I think you'll find that the desire to, to break into these systems will, will decrease significantly. Nice, nice. And there's, there's still a few more. I don't know how much time you... Uh, no, go for it. One. Yeah, yeah no. sure. So, uh, so someone asked... So, I mean, kind of in rapid succession, we saw two action replays on two different consoles. Uh, so someone asked, why aren't action replays or other cheating games around for modern day consoles? Uh, I think the landscape has changed. You know, I mentioned that um, security has been significantly increased these days. Uh, there's there's crypto that's that's pretty much involved in every step of the way. Memory is encrypted. You know, memory at rest is encrypted. You know what I mean? So... Um, the action replay kind of, you know, works on the concept of peaking and poking memory, um, which is usually something, you know, w which would require obviously the appropriate permissions to do so, as well as the appropriate um, encryption to do so. Uh, and, you know, the GameCube obviously was one because everything was, was unencrypted. Um, the original Xbox was unencrypted memory. Um, the, the PlayStation 2 was unencrypted memory. So, that whole concept is a lot more difficult when you start talking about, you know, memory that's not, that's, that's not mm -hmm. decrypted or it's, it's encrypted at every step of the way, even at rest, you know? So if you try to access memory, um, you know, it's just, it's all encrypted. So I think ultimately that whole concept of the action replay cheating, it's kind of days were numbered, you know, mm -hmm. after, you know, the sixth generation of, 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 of console. Yeah, I think one well, thing I've seen a little bit more. Console. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. You good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've I've noticed a little bit more prevalence in terms of uh, like save game mods. So I've seen for Xbox 360. I remember there was a pretty decent uh, like cheating in the form of you would get a, a save game, you would modify it, and then you would kind of load it back on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I haven't seen very much recently, so that that makes sense. Thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, so someone asked, would you say software or hardware protections are generally harder to break on consoles? Uh, I think hardware is significantly harder to, to break than software. Um, the, the, the issue with software, not that there is an issue, but the, I guess the issue with, with software in that, you know, a human coded that software, right? So humans make, make mistakes, humans um, make available some areas that they may have not tested appropriately. Um, so, you know, I think hardware is, is, is always going to be the winner in that one. Nice. Uh, so another one said uh, anything interesting with the Sega Saturn? Yes. Um, I will be covering the Sega Saturn in a future video, uh, pretty soon actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, stay tuned. Like, uh, but to give you the cliff notes, the Sega Saturn had the same concept that the PlayStation original had. It had the same kind of wobble groove concept, but Sony did things differently, a little differently, um, but it was enough for their, their protection to really be a lot more tighter than, than the PlayStation 1. But um, that, that whole thing has been, has been well and truly defeated. And you, you, like nowadays you can buy um, you know, uh, SD, SD um, loaders where you can load all the games off SD cards and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I'll definitely be covering that in a future episode. Nice, nice. So someone asked, what font do you use for your video title cards? <laughs> um, I, I use um, US, US, US 101, I think it's called. So check, check out US 101. That's, that's the font that I use. Nice. Oh, okay. so, so the next question is someone that I guess did a deep dive. So why did you choose Lantis as your Xbox homebrew dev name? Um, when I was growing up, that name was given to me as a nickname uh, in school. I don't remember the exact reason why I got that name, but it was just kind of a name that I just stuck with, you know, uh, when I was coming up with a, a handle to call myself uh, sort of Lantus, because that's that's what uh, everyone was calling me back in the day. So I just kind of stuck with that. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, so the, and there's there's three more questions if you're still yeah. okay with it. Uh, yeah. So someone asked, do you think there's anything morally wrong with pirating games once you can no longer buy them in stores or when they're only available on secondary markets? Uh, I don't think there is anything morally wrong with that. I think if a game is, and I, I guess I need to be careful the way that I kind of say that, but you know, I, I'm, I don't agree with software piracy. Uh, I want to be very clear on that. I think, I think um, it's not something that I, you know, 
would ever advocate for. But I think if there was no other choice, right? Um, if there was literally no other choice and the only way you could play it was to download a copy, then yes, I, I, I'm, I'm very much on board with that. And we've seen that um, with some games that get delisted from digital storefronts that don't have a physical release. And if the only way to play that game again is to download or download the ROM and an emulator, then yes, I'm, I'm all about it. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I mean, same here. I, I feel like preservation, especially when you look at the older consoles where it, some games were made by like one developer that no longer has the source code. And it's just crazy to see things that can just like poof disappear on a one's notice. Uh, so someone asked, are you familiar with anything about jailbreaking iPhones, which has similar hardware restrictions as game consoles? You know, I never really got into the iPhone jailbreaking scene. I know Geohot was was someone that kind of kickstarted that whole thing as well. Um, it's not really my cup of tea. I'm not really uh, big on the phone thing. Like, you know, I usually try to avoid using my phone um, throughout the most of the time. So, um, yeah, I'm not really my my cup of tea. Cool. Uh, so someone asked, how long do you think it'll be until, uh, like, wait, so how long do you think it'll take to homebrew the PS4 and Xbox One? And do you think that backwards compatibility in the PS5 and Series X would be a major part of how to crack them? Um, so the PS4 already has a homebrew scene. It's already been hacked. Uh, it's, it's a scene that isn't really widely known about because there are restrictions on the version of firmware that you need to be on to do so but there is definitely a homebrew community on the PS4. Um, I'm planning on covering it. I'll say uh, I've, I've done, I've done one video on the PS4 uh, recently about, about the homebrew scene, but haven't really gone into too much detail about it only because it's still a, a system that you can buy in stores. So, um, you know, I definitely do want to wait maybe a couple of years before it's no longer available before I really d d dig into that. But yes, there is a, there is a homebrew scene on the PS4 um if you choose to to look into it you, you'll find it on the xbox um i don't think it's ever going to happen i think their security is is very very well done this time around and the other thing is you know both both companies can push updates over the air uh you know without you even knowing about it and just close up loopholes and stuff like that which is mm -hmm. typically what they do so um, and will backward compatibility help the, those scenes? I don't think that that will be um, a help for them either. So I don't, I don't believe so, no. Nice. And then the last question that I see is, is the source code for your homebrew applications available online, like GitHub, SourceForge, anything? Yeah, um, it is. Uh, so I do have a GitHub channel where I've got various projects on there. But if you want like my archive of the OG Xbox homebrew projects that I worked on, many, many years ago. Um, and maybe Nima, I can email it to you after the show. Um, I've got an archive.org um, page where I've just got all sorts of various things that I've uploaded, um, just various projects in various states of completion, source code to different emulators and things that I worked on. Uh, so yeah, uh, wow. I'll send it to you and, and feel free to check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll append them to the slides and then we can distribute it with everything. Cool. Cool. Nice. And I think that's it for the questions. Um, yeah. I don't know, Chris, did you want to say anything before we? Uh, yeah. You know, I just wanted to wrap up by thanking you both. Um, and so let me try this out real quick here. All right. Um, yeah. yeah. So hopefully you can uh, see my screen maybe here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we always present our guests with a little certificate of appreciation, um, which we'll email out to you as well. Oh. Um, so first, uh, Modern Vintage Gamer, Demetrius, uh, we can update the name if you want. But thanks so much for being here. Uh, you've been a great guest. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, man. It's, it, was, it was fun to, uh, to, uh, to hang out with everyone for the, the last couple of hours. And yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was awesome. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, cool. Nima, we also have one for you. Uh, oh, thank you. So you've been a great host. Uh, and thank you for, again for inviting uh, Demetrius to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to just be able to chat with everyone and hopefully <laughs> get people interested in the more fun sides of computer science rather than just my data structures. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, with that, I think we can call it a night. Um, and yeah, if anyone's looking, we're on our Discord, which I'll post in the chat here. Um, so feel free to join us, uh, you two, Nima or Demetrius. So. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Right. I'll talk to you all another time then. Yep. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.